Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Books and Books here in beautiful downtown Coral Gables. We are live on the internet. Just a reminder to our internet audience, if at any time during tonight's presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, you can give us a call here at the store on the number on your screen and we'll get a book autograph for you and ship it to you for free of charge uh, for shipping anyway here in the United States. And for those of you that are here, uh, please silence your cell phones and don't forget to pick up a copy of our Books and Books newsletter. This will give you a synopsis of all the wonderful events we have at Books and Books uh, just about every night of the week. We do 60 plus every month, sometimes four a night. We have Spanish events, we have kids events, poetry readings, first time authors and celebrity signings. And when you do visit our website, please give us your email address so you don't miss a thing that goes on here because we do have so much that goes on. And also don't forget to visit our newest Books and Books location. We are now uh, downtown Miami at the Adrian Arsh Center in the historic Sears Tower. We have a beautiful cafe, a full bar, a bookstore, a great place to be. Of course, when you're not here, you can be there. So we appreciate you uh, visiting us down there. But tonight we are very happy to have with us uh, Miss Bar Barrett Brogard and On Romantic Love. Romantic love presents some of life's most challenging questions. Can we choose who to love? Is romantic love random? Can we love more than one person at a time? And can we make ourselves fall out of love? On Romantic Love, Barrett Brogard attempts to get to the bottom of love's many contradictions. This book, informed by both historical and cutting-edge philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience, combines with a new theory of romantic love with entertaining anecdotes from real life and accessible explanations of the neuroscience underlying our wildest passions. This engaging and innovative look at this universal topic featuring original line drawings by illustrator Gareth Southwell illuminates the processes behind heartbreak, obsession, jealousy, attachment, and more. Jesse Prinz, professor of philosophy from the City University of New York says, this enthralling synthesis of philosophy, psychology, and brain science makes romance relevant to the loves we lead. Brogard's fact-based answers will deepen your understanding and may even deepen your relationships. Barrett Brogard is a professor of philosophy at the University of Miami. Her academic research, she specializes in philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, and the cognitive science. Please just give her a nice, warm, loving welcome, Barrett Brogard. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and thanks to everyone for coming today to listen to uh, this presentation. Uh, I obviously will not be able to cover all of the book's contents uh, within the time limits, uh, but let me uh, say a little bit about the uh, book uh, and its contents and uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, rationality or irrationality of love. Uh, also a little bit about the uh, neurotransmitters underlying love uh, and depending on time uh, I might uh, debunk some myth since it's uh, the day before Valentine's Day so <laughs> it seems to be the trends. Uh, <coughs> so um, I left out uh, chapter one here which is uh, basically an overview uh, and it has a nice little story which goes through the book uh, about a real relationship between Zoe and Brandon, uh, a friend of mine. Zoe is a friend of mine. Um, in, in the first uh, sort of real chapter, chapter two, uh, I talk about uh, some of the chemicals underlying romantic love. I haven't really told you what I mean by romantic love. Uh, but for now, it will do to say that I include everything from the strong infatuation stages um, to something that's a little more secure and settled. Um, <coughs> what I focus on in, in that chapter is saying that in those beginning stages, they, and they will be beginning stages, um, love is a bit like a drug. Um, which can make you addicted uh, in various ways. It can make you addicted to a particular person. Uh, it can also just make you addicted to the feeling of being in love. Uh, so just as, as you might have heard about sex addiction, there's also such a thing as love addiction. Um, there are two uh, of the main, most interesting chemicals underlying um, those stages. One is called serotonin and uh, you might have heard about that because that's a neurotransmitter that's talked a lot about when we talk about antidepressants. Um, and what it does when the antidepressant in 
that works on that system, what that does is basically that it stabilizes your serotonin levels. So I like to think of serotonin as something that makes you secure and self-confident and feel good about yourself. Now, when you're anxious and depressed and stressed out, the serotonin levels in the brain drop. And when we look at the chemical profile of a person's brain who is in love, um, it will have the same lower serotonin levels. So more so at the beginning, very, very beginning stages than later on in a little, little more mature relationship. So that's the one serotonin. The other major, 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 major uh, chemical that uh, influences what you feel and, and love, romantic love, is dopamine. And dopamine has a lot of different functions. Uh, it's uh, involved in, in addictions, drug addiction, uh, shopping addiction, gambling addiction, and addiction to love. Uh, and in love itself. It's also what actually motivates you. If you don't have enough dopamine, you're not going to have normal movements. Some people can't move at all. In fact, people with Parkinson's disease, the main problem is low levels of dopamine. So you give them something like dopamine to, to help treat their symptoms. So dopamine is is wildly present at the times when you feel pleasure in romantic love, which is why it, why it might either lead to an addiction or feel like an addiction. Uh, so dopamine is giving you a reward. It's a reward chemical. So that's underlying that state, uh, state of romantic love. And so you can see how love might seem a lot like a drug, and, and love is a lot like a drug, uh, a drug like cocaine, um, to a lesser extent like heroin that works slightly differently. Um, but it, it, it works a lot like um, a drug because it's the same chemicals. It can also work a bit like a mood disorder because it's some of the same chemicals. So I talk about that in in chapter two. Um, and I'll get back to that later. Um, what I do say in chapter three is that although love functions a bit like a drug, romantic love, or can function that way, uh, we wouldn't want to equate love with that chemical state. So you will see headlines like love is a chemical state or love is a chemical cocktail. But that, of course, uh, is incorrect. Um, I give a philosophical account of love, where love is an emotion. Um, that sounds to everyone but philosophers like a very trivial claim, except that everyone but philosopher, I mean, everyone who is a philosopher has argued otherwise, almost. Um, and we'll, I'll not go too much into that, you know, only to say that a very, um, famous uh, person who has written on love, Helen Fisher, uh, has argued that love is a drive as opposed to an emotion. A drive is more like an instinct. And uh, she uses a dopamine argument to support that. She has other arguments, but that's one argument she uses. She says, well, look, do dopamine is heavily involved in sex, is heavily involved in early, the early stages of romantic love, so it looks like just as sex seems to be a drive, that romantic love should be a drive. Now, she may be right, but the argument does not work because dopamine is also involved in aggression and anger. And at least philosophers would not say that aggression and anger is merely a drive. It might also involve a drive, but it's anger uh, is, is a classical case of an emotion. Um, the account I give of emotions is, uh, is one where um, it's a bit like a perception. So you can, uh, you can misperceive your loved one. Um, you can even hallucinate your loved one. 
So I will allow for cases of kids having invisible friends that they're in love with. Um, I will allow for people being in love or feeling love for uh, their dead relatives or their dead spouse. Um, and I'll also allow for cases where people get things right. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of perception, uh, and that's because I consider emotions as kinds of perceptions. They're not standard perceptions, so I'm seeing you right now as more true emotions than just that. Uh, emotions are also directed towards our chemical states. So if my heart is beating, that directedness towards my heart's beating is part of what constitutes love. So it has two components. It has a component that's directed outwards and one that's directed in towards your own physical or physiological changes. So you are in love with someone, whether or not that someone exists, right? So that's the outwards. Um, you're not just in love, but not with no one in, it in particular. Um, and at least when love is conscious, you also have feelings associated with it. And again, when it's conscious, we'll get back to that. It's not always conscious. But when it's conscious, you have feelings associated with that. And so that's your feelings of your body reacting to the external uh, stimuli or the misperceived external stimuli. So that's sort of what I say in, uh, in chapter four, in chapter three, sorry. I'm going to say more about um, um, chapter four, uh, which is uh, about whether or not love can be uh, rational. But I'm going to just go over what I'm actually saying in some of the other chapters because I'm going to say a bit more about chapter four. Um, so chapter four is basically, does it make sense to say that love can be rational uh, or irrational? Again, when I talk to people who are not in academia, they will say, yes, of course that makes sense. When I talk to philosophers, they will say, or psychologists, they will say, no, that makes no sense at all. Um, well, I, uh, I go on from that, which I'll return to, to talk about uh, relationships and attachment love. And I talk about that because attachment love is something I think is often confused with uh, romantic love. So a lot of times people will say, oh yeah, we've been in love for 80 years. Um, maybe that is true in some cases. I think in some cases people confuse um, attachments and the occasional sort of lust that might, might be present still. Uh, in that combination, they might confuse that with uh, romantic love. Um, and I also talk about in that chapter about how, um, how your childhood, of course, can make you have an avoidance attachment style, which is a kind of commitment phobia that can be a way to talk about it, or an anxious attachment style, which can be a way to talk about uh, this kind of clingy behavior, seeking out the other person constantly. But I also have something positive in there, namely that you are not doomed if your childhood was really bad. So if you have an insecure, as we also call these uh, bad attachment styles, if you have an insecure attachment style, well, it can still change. Uh, of course, you're not necessarily always fully in control over whether or not it will change, but it's not fully shaped by what happened when you were um, a child. My view is also uh, slightly different from other people's view of love because I think that such a thing as unconscious love, love that is not felt, um, it's something that we, we, don't, we don't usually think of it that way. The same with, uh, I'll just include the, the uh, chapter seven as well, degrees of love, so, so feeling less love at one point in time and feeling more love at another point in time. Um, the reason we're not sort of, I mean, we, we kind of know that's the case, but it sounds odd when your spouse asks you, do you love me? And you say, yeah, 
kind of to a little bit, to a little bit to a degree, um, but not not every day. Uh, so so it's but that that's sort of the reality of it. Uh, that's well, maybe it's not true that you don't love the person all the time, but at least not consciously, right? You might not feel it all the time. So I talk about unconscious love and how that can be possible. Uh, it's kind of difficult to see how it can be possible because what is this unconscious stuff that's going on? Uh, where is it? How does it affect us? Well, I say that it's if you if you do have some kind of unconscious love, it is going to affect your, your behavior. Maybe not all the time, but that would be a way of attributing that kind of unconscious love to you by, uh, by looking at your behavior, and, and that would be a way for you to be unconsciously in love. The degrees of love, uh, is, has, it hasn't been pointed out much, but it's really true. We don't love everyone to the same extent. We might love one person more than another. We might love the same person more on one day than on another day. So in the degrees of love, um, people sometimes get a little bit uncomfortable about that, but it's really true because there's no, in principle, there's no maximum degree of love, right? Uh, it's, it's not clear what that would be. What would be maximum a degree of love be? So you're always sort of on a scale, and, and that can go up and down. And so I talk about that. Um, I briefly go into the question, which will relate to what I will say in a minute, see, about love and sex, where I, I talk about, again, about, a little bit about attachment. So there are some studies showing that people with a very special condition where they experience colors and textures when they have an orgasm, uh, or when they have just sex, um, they get into a sort of a sexual trance, but it turns out that they don't have the most satisfying sexual experience because they don't have the connection to the other person. They are lacking that connection because they could feel alone with that sexual trance. So, so there's, there, there's, there are actually three components to, to good sex, and those would be two of them. Uh, the third one would be role playing, uh, which we'll be happy to talk about in Q and A. Um, I also talk about whether sex can be uh, rational or irrational, and that sort of follows what I'll say about love. And chapter nine is uh, the how to fall out of love, uh, with a lot of different techniques for how to fall out of love. Uh, and they have all been tried, some successfully, some less successfully, but, uh, but it's uh, at least possible for some people. And the final chapter is on well-being and happiness. And love, love uh, overall does seem to make us happy according to empirical studies, but marriage doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't wait for that marriage proposal tomorrow night. Uh, or turn it down, if you get it. But back to the rationality of love. So is it, is it, um, can it be rational or irrational to love someone? Um, yeah, we talk that way. At least, well, we do it with fear, for instance, right? So I might say, oh, really, you fear flying, but flying is so much safer than driving a car, and you don't fear, dri fear driving your car, so you're irrational for fearing flying. And I want to say uh, the same about love. Well, there are cases where your love is irrational, and there are cases where it's rational. Now, people have complained about that a lot, and so here are some complaints. So the great old German philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, said that love, of course, cannot be set, meaningfully set, to be rational irration or, or rational because you can't <laughs> control it. You either fall in love or you don't. You're either in love or you don't. You can't control that. Okay, well... Um, I might, well, as you can see in chapter 9, I, I disagree with that to some extent. But even if we granted that, um, that's a bad argument. It's a bad argument for many reasons. Um, 
Well, one reason is that we usually can't control our beliefs either. So if I just decide to believe that this room is empty, it's not going to work very well. Right? Or if I'm going to uh, uh, force myself to believe right now that the chair of my department is at a certain restaurant where he could be, it, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to be able to willfully form beliefs but beliefs are the kinds of things that are rational or irrational, actually, the best cases of that. Well, what, so, so, the, so, so Kant's argument really doesn't hold up. Well, other people, the sort of modern, more modern people say, oh, but love is not sensitive to evidence. What does that mean? It means that, it, you know, if I think it's raining because I look outside, and water is pouring down. Okay, so I believe it's raining. Now, you tell me you're super reliable. You never tell a lie. So, and you don't joke either. You're kind of boring. Um, <laughs> so, you tell me that there's a newly installed greenhouse on top, on the rooftop. And they put up some sprinklers. And that's actually accounting for the water falling down. Now, I will automatically revise my belief, right, if I'm at least pretty normal. In fact, I'll be crazy if I keep believing that it's raining. Okay, so that me that's what it means to be sensitive, for something to be sensitive to evidence. Okay, what about love? Okay, so I'm in love with some a person. Uh, you tell me that that person is no good for me. I really shouldn't love that person. It's really bringing me down psychologically. Uh, no, it's not going to work the same way. I'm not going to, just going to jump out of that state of love. So we are not quite sensitive to, uh, or love is not as sensitive to evidence as, say, belief. But it's sensitive to some extent. Um, I'll give an analogy to anger, which is also an emotion, right? So, so certainly anger is sensitive to evidence. We know that from practices of mindfulness, right? So you have this little thing that is making you really angry out of proportion and someone reminds you to be mindful and sort of see the great perspective of things and you can kind of, at least in some cases, talk yourself out of that anger state, right? So it's sensitive to evidence. Can you do that with love too? Yes. I think you can. I think it's a long-term project. Uh, I think it takes more effort. In the belief case, it just happens. But I don't think that it's not sensitive to evidence. I just think it's, it's a de degree difference. Okay. So here's another uh, thing that philosophers have said against uh, love being rational, irrational. So Syracuse uh, philosopher Thomas says, hey, look, you know, you might fall out of love with a person even though that person has not changed a bit, right? And that's perfectly all right. Of course, you should not con force yourself to continue loving that person even if the person hasn't changed a bit. So he says, well, but that shows that love can't be rational or irrational because it would seem to show that it would be rational for you to continue to love that person. The person didn't change. Well, my response to that is, hey, rash rational love doesn't entail being required to love. That entails being permitted to love. Right? So when love is rational, you are permitted to love. In the case of romantic love, of course it is. There are many, many, many people out there that are lovable. You can't out be romantically in love with all of them. So we can't have this requirement to love just all lovable people, right? So you are permitted to love a person when it's rational. What about when it's irrational? Well, then I do have, or we'll take a, a stand on this and say, well, then you're, you ought to, you really ought to uh, 
fall out of love. Do what you can to fall out of love. But that might not just involve moving uh, out of the house, because if you're still affected by it, it might involve taking other uh, measures. So what does it mean to be, for, for love to be irrational? Well, the basic uh, thing, I think, love is irrational when uh, it uh, negatively affects your well-being. Um, so when all else being, being equal, it negatively affects your well-being, then the love is, is irrational. There are other ways it can be irrational. Let's say that you totally idealize a new love, a new love subject. Um, you completely idealize that person, overlook all of that person's flaws, and your love is fueled by that. Well, then the love is also irrational. And so that those two things, your love has to fit the situation. And your love can't be based on a misperception, based on a misperception, right? Fueled by the misperception of the other person. So that's what I take uh, irrational love to be. Um, let me just see how long I'm going on for here. Um, OK. Let me say one more thing about uh, rationality before going into the myth. Some people will say, well, look, if love can be rational, irrational, then you love people for a reason. And that seems like. Uh, vanity, a case of vanity. Like, if you ask me, like, why did you, why do you love your, your new boyfriends? And I say, oh, uh, because of his his blue hair. Um, this is this doesn't ring true, right? It, it, it may be, I mean, at best, a case of extreme vanity. Uh, what I want to say here is, well, there are two different ways to talk about reasons, right? So there are there are causal or explanatory reasons. So let's take a case of that. UK, you, you murder someone because you were angry. Just because you were angry. No other reason. You kill that person. We ask, why did you kill that person? Or why did she kill that person? The answer could be, well, she was really, really, really angry. Now, that's the causal or explanatory, which explains why you did what, it, what you did. But it doesn't justify your actions, doesn't excuse them. But say you did it in self-defense. In that case, it's more likely to be a justifying reason. So you were justified in actually doing what you did. Um, what I want to say is, uh, when we talk about reasons for love, Let's talk about not the causal ones. That could be all kinds of things. Who knows? Pheromones, uh, things we don't even know about. But let's talk about, let's talk about the justificatory reasons. The justificatory reasons, or the reasons that justify, uh, are simple enough. What's a reason to love a person? Very, very simple answer. They are lovable. OK, that, you're not going to be happy with this answer until I explain it. But they are lovable. That's the reason. That's the reason that can justify your love. OK. It's a, this sounds strange, but think about fear. What's the reason, if I'm justified, in fearing a snake? What's the reason for that? Because the snake is dangerous, right? Um, the snake is dangerous, right? I love because the person is lovable. Now, dangerous, of course, covers a number of different properties. And that will vary from person to person, situation to situation, and so on. Fear. OK. Let's say you were uh, on American Airlines 10 years ago when it still served peanuts. Um, most of you, I'm guessing, ought not fear the bag of peanuts, eating them. Right? Because the peanuts are not dangerous. But if you have a severe peanut allergy, the peanuts are dangerous, eating them. So in that case, right, there's a difference. So the person with a peanut allergy 
for that person, the peanut, eating the peanuts will be a dangerous thing to do. For the other person, it won't. So in this case, what's in the peanuts will determine relative to you whether something is dangerous or not. And the same with lovable. A person can be lovable to one, to one person and not to another. It's not so, it's very, very similar to fear and all the other emotions. And that's the kind, that's the only reason that can justify love is that a person is lovable and specifically lovable for you. Okay, so now we'll um, move on to uh, the, most people probably think the more fun part of this. Uh, the debunking some myths about uh, love. Uh, so, so, uh, So the the uh, oh, that's the wrong one. Um, so this one this one may be familiar to those of you who are who are more experts on uh, on love. Um, uh, you can actually make someone fall in love with you. I mean this is um, this is not this is the 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 the, uh, the myth is that you can't, and this is the answer to it. Well, you can actually make someone fall in love with you. Uh, it seems it seems odd if you are not up on the most. Actually, it's been on all over the media recently, so so you're probably familiar with some of that. So the case in the media again. The wrong one. Um, the in the case of the, the case in the media was based on uh, an old experiment where Aaron um, put two strangers in a lab, and uh, they were asked to ask each other very intimate questions, more and more intimate as you go along. So things that you don't normally talk about when you do small talk with people. Um, so what do you find most attractive in a woman or a man? Um, or if you were to die this evening with no opportunity to communicate with anyone, what would you most regret not having told someone? Uh, and success. The two people fell in love. They also had to look into each other's eyes for about four minutes. And that was recently um, sort of replicated um, and also with success. Uh, which you might have read about in the media, though not completely replicated because this, this setting was a bar, not a laboratory. They were not complete strangers. And presumably they wouldn't have done this if they weren't sort of open to letting it happen. Uh, why do we have, uh, why, 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 why can this happen? What is it about this kind of asking these very intimate questions that can actually trigger love. That has to do with intimacy. Because intimacy also actually is likely to give rise to a rise in dopamine. So that's the, dopamine is the reward chemical. It makes you feel good, it makes you addicted. Um, and, and so that, that's one aspect of it, and basically the brain is really good at confusing things in the body uh, with love. It's very good at it. We'll get back to more cases like that. Okay, the, the famous bridge case. So in the famous Brits case, a woman, a Brits, like a, a dangerous Brits. So go back to it again. It's dangerous, very dangerous. Adrenaline flowing when you go on it. Um, so a woman pretended to do a survey. And what she did was she conducted the survey on that Brits, something like the Brits we just saw, as well as on solid ground. And then after the survey, which is standard in research, she said, like, here's my phone number in case you have follow-up questions. And what happened later? Who called her back for, with follow-ups? The people on the Brits called her back with follow-ups. The reason for that, uh, the explanation is that the Brits caused adrenaline to flow 
Well, actually, that's linked to what we talked about before, the low serotonin, which can trigger increased adrenaline, fear processing. And the brain very often um, confuses that feeling with feelings of love. So tomorrow, don't cancel that restaurant booking you have for Valentine's <laughs> Day. And, uh, and see if you can find a theme park. I guess it's a little far away. We'll have Tampa is the best one. Disney won't do it. Disney World won't do it. There's two. So, so, uh, so do that or go paragliding or something like that. Uh, this kind of dinner thing won't work. So there's, a, there's another famous experiment, actually. Uh, it goes back to many years back before we had to get ethics approval for our studies. And uh, Schachter and Singer decided to uh, inject adrenaline into the arteries of, of students. Um, of course, they had a control group as well. Uh, and those they injected with the adrenaline, some of them they told uh, the truth just to have another kind of control. But most of them they told that it was a vitamin, but they were testing a vitamin. And as they were waiting to, after they got the shots, they were waiting to get the, uh, you know, interview with the researchers. They were sitting in a waiting room. And some of the, the people who were told that they were testing a vitamin and had this adrenaline in their, in their bodies, they had someone come in who was extremely funny, uh, gave compliments, made them feel good. And when they went into the researchers, they almost had this feeling of, it wasn't quite romantic love, but they had this euphoria experience. Uh, the other ones got into a different waiting room where there was someone who was being extremely insulting and extremely rude and so on. And when they got into the, the experimenters, um, they actually had this feeling of feeling miserable. So, so the brain, the brain, of course, can interpret uh, adrenaline in different ways, um, but but one thing that's for sure is that uh, probably because of evolution, it very often interprets adrenaline rushes as signs of love if there's the right environment in place. Okay, so cancel the dinner. <laughs> yeah, ouch. Um, <laughs> do you really want to fall in love? Uh, the thing is, love hurts, and it's going to hurt. Just admit it. If you, if you have been in a longest love relationship and you have not feel, felt any pain, uh, I don't think you have been in love. I don't think you have actually <laughs> had a loving relationship. It, love hurts, and, and uh, it sometimes hurts more than breaking your arm. And in fact, when you look at the brain, it's the very same areas of the brain uh, that you will see lit up uh, on, on a functional MRI as in physical pain. The firing is exactly the same. So it's pain. Emotional pain is pain. Um, do you sometimes feel a pain in your heart? Some people don't always do that. Some people feel it in their shoulders or neck or it's the stress-related kind of pain, which also is associated with being in love and in relationships. Well, that, is, that, is, that can also be f physical pain because if you're very stressed out, again, uh, adrenaline will increase and it can lead to what is called broken heart syndrome, which is a real thing. In broken heart syndrome, which also has a fancy medical word, uh, your levels of adrenaline are much higher than in cases of classic heart attack. They're much higher than, even higher than in normal people. And it weakens the heart muscle. Sometimes people die. That's what you see sometimes when one spouse dies and then the other spouse dies just after that. Um, but luckily, it's curable. So in many cases, people catch it in time. But it's, it's, a, real, it's a real condition. Um, so think, think twice about that love thing. Okay, now, 
Okay. Let's say that things did go wrong. So you, you actually went for it. You went for the love thing, didn't work out. Now you're, now you're heartbroken. You need to get out of it. Um, what, uh, should we, what should we do about that? Um, you might have seen the, the movie, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. There you can actually go in and erase memories, which might be convenient. But the brain doesn't work that way. And I'm not going to mention the white bear to you because too many people have probably heard about it. The white pear, bear that pops into your head when you don't think about it. And I mentioned it anyway. Um, there's something to be said for doing the opposite because you can tire the brain. The brain gets very tired when it gets the same stimulus over and over and over again. Um, it's a well-studied phenomenon. And that you could use. It might be a little painful to, be to begin with. But why don't you go into that? So let's say it's your the love of your life who broke up with you. I uh, was driving a particular car. Go in, find the store, the Audi store, uh, and ask to test drive that car. And keep going. <laughs> Just keep going every day until you're thrown out. Or find something else that you can do to expose yourself and, and make your brain literally tired. Um, so um, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that, that is, is well studied that when we keep being exposed to the same information, we, we tune out. Eventually we tune out. The brain does not get bored. Um, it may take a little longer for cases of love. Okay. Placement conditioning. So this is something you've probably read about uh, a, a thousand times, but here's actually the, the real explanation of, of it. So what you have read is probably, after a breakup, change your apartment around. Well, the, expl the explanation of it is actually something that is very real. It's been studied in heroin addicts. What people started noticing was there were these herons, uh, heroin addicts, they were meeting at a specific time, on a specific day, maybe every day, at the same place with the same friends, and they were shooting heroin. And they were fine. Yeah, they fine to the extent that they weren't dying. Uh, suddenly, one of them goes to a different location, or with new friends, or at a different time, and they OD. Same dose, same dose. And it's not an off day for them physically is change of environment. You might think of the situation that you may be, find yourself in if you have a glass of wine with, with dinner, but suddenly you go to that wedding reception. It's 10 in the morning, and they serve champagne. And that one glass of champagne like messes you up a lot more than that one glass of wine with dinner. Same thing. Right. In this case, with the alcohol, is that your body can get used to producing the enzymes to break down the alcohol uh, at, at 8 o'clock with dinner. Doesn't do it, is not used to doing it at, at the 10 a.m. wedding reception. So, um, so the heroin addict is actually that, that meets regularly with the same people, uh, is telling the body, okay, here's the dose, the exact dose. This is the time it's coming, and the body's preparing what it can to avoid uh, tragedy, death. Let's say that they, they decide to quit. So the heroin addicts and, uh, and the friends, they decide to quit. Um, now, which location might be worse to be in for the heroin addicts? After quitting the old location at the same time with the same friends uh, or a new one? Well, for the very same reason that the body was preparing to, to get rid of this heron, it's much worse, much worse to be in the old location. Uh, and so you can actually transfer that to, to the drug. In this case, the drug is your ex. Right? So that's why you want to change. So that was the, the blue hair, so to like dye your, blue, your hair blue or, um, or move the love seat to the other side of the room. 
Um, okay, so one last one. So people will tell you, don't go out drinking. Go, go, don't go out drinking until you fall over if you just broke up with someone. Um, they used to tell people that. Or if you, are exper you, ha you have this traumatic experience, you lose a loved one or something else, don't go out drinking. It will just make things worse. False. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that the reason that breakups and traumas and losing one's loved one to death, anything, can be so problematic is that memories are normally, they normally take time to store. Memories don't just store immediately. They, you have your brain practice them over and over without you knowing them. But that's an exception to that. When something is traumatic, when you experience something that's emotionally intense, the storage is immediate and is angered, right? Uh, relatively immediate. But now, as you also know, alcohol can sort of loosen that up a little bit, especially if you drink enough of it. So, so this has actually been studied. If you go out and you get drunk, it's not been studied in people after breaking up, but it, it's been studied in people with uh, experiencing severe, tr severe traumas, where some of them went out for a few days and just got completely plastered, and then some of them didn't. And the people who got really drunk for a few days, they actually did not have th as many symptoms of post-traumatic uh, st uh, stress disorder as the people who were just um, getting, uh, you know, home, lying in bed or whatever. So go out and get drunk uh, as a skunk. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ed. I got, I got three quick comments. <coughs> One, I wish I had written this book. <laughs> <laughs> this is a terrific book. I haven't read it, but I'm sure it is. Second, on, um, I think it's chapter six, where you talk about unconscious will. It's kind of curious that Freud and the psychoanalysts who followed him all you talked know? about unconscious hate. Typically a patient yeah. at the end of the therapy would discover he or she actually hated one of his parents. But Freud never talked about unconscious love. That's kind of curious. That I is, why. that is, uh, that is. What is he saying? Oh, no. he said that Freud and, and, the, and Jung talked about unconscious hate, but didn't talk about unconscious love. Um, it's, it is curious, and there are quotes that directly state that he thinks there's a contradiction in terms, but he never says why. So that is curious, yes. Now my other comment concerns the idea that you can cure love and get over it. Now, there's a general question here about emotions. I often have this conversation with my wife. I say, <laughs> she says, I'm really angry about this email message I was sent. And I say, you are justified in being angry, but it's not useful to be angry, so stop feeling angry. And she replies, I married a dope. You can't just stop feeling angry, you stop. But in fact, you can. It's just that you can't do it immediately. Mm -hmm. There are people in clinical psychology, behavior therapists, who decided a long time ago that feelings of depression, anxiety, and so on were actually identical with behavior. They were wrong about that, but they did have a good point. Let's say someone is feeling very depressed. A behavior therapist will say, what went on before you started feeling depressed? What kind of behaviors did you engage in when you felt happy? Well, I would talk to my friends, I would drink my wine, I would go to parties, and then they would identify behaviors that are now being uh, exhibited by the patient and try to convince the patient to start engaging in behaviors which are incompatible with the depression, causally incompatible. Yeah. Start talking to your friends again, start drinking my wine again, start, start reading books here, whatever you enjoy. And uh, it doesn't cure all depression, it doesn't get rid of all feelings. But it takes a bit of time, but sometimes it does work. Yeah, yeah. And probably the same thing for love. I've never seen this kind of analysis applied to love, but probably it would work for love too. Yeah.
I think that's right. Um, it reminds me of the, the famous quote from William James, uh, yes, where he yeah. says, uh, you don't, you're, not, yeah, you're not crying because, well, the other, that's, yeah. You're not crying because you're sad. Uh, you're sad because you're crying. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, I, I don't know if, if uh, Oh, you wanted a short version of what uh, he said, this, but both parts? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. The first, uh, so the, 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 let me start with the second part. The second part of what Ed was saying was that um, the short version is sometimes you can cure a bad mood or a depression by engaging in the very behaviors you used to do when you were not depressed. So th there's a tendency, maybe if you're depressed, you lie in bed all day, you don't take the shower, uh, and so on. But if you, um, if, you, if you actually engage in the behaviors that you used to engage in when you were not depressed, um, you may actually, may actually lift the depression. So that was, that was a very short version of the second point. Um, and the first point, um, Remind me. The first point was it's a very good book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good book. I meant, I meant the second point, sorry. The second point was that Freud talks about unconscious hate. Oh. Never about unconscious love. So he was, he was wondering why uh, the psychoanalyst uh, Sigmund Freud was talking about unconscious hate, but not unconscious love. And the answer is it's a good question. We're talking about love, but what is really love? I mean, there are so many emotions that we go through in our life. Mm -hmm. I like somebody, uh, somebody is really, uh, I want to be with this person, but am I in love? How mm -hmm. do I know that I'm really in love? Uh, I think it would be good to define what really love is. Is this this mad thing when you run around in the street? And of course, I've been in this state, and then I want to be with this person, not necessarily sexually, but just embrace this person and be with that person. Is that love, or how do you define love? And maybe it's just I something un totally unromantic. Sometimes it's just, you know, you want to get at it, and um, is that love? I think they all. <laughs> I think they're all forms of love. They're just different kinds of love. There's. There's infatuation. I, I take that to be a kind of love. Then there's a more, uh, slightly more secure, what some people would rather identify with romantic love, right? So let's call that uh, a kind of love as well. Then there's attachment love. That's a kind of love. I think even lust, for, I have an argument for that. I think even lust, not all lust, but some forms of lust can actually also be um, looked at as, as a kind of love. Then there's parental love, friendship love. Um, there are so many different kinds of love. We don't have to give the same definition of all of them. But I do give definitions of the limited kinds of love that I look at in the book. And one brief uh, other question. Uh, is there a love center? So if you have a brain damage, can this love center, for example, be damaged and you're incapable of any feeling similar to it? Well, Helen Fisher argued that if you take an SSRI, uh, so a selective serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitor, that's an antidepressant of a special kind, you are uh, less likely to fall in love. So yes, if you, uh, if, you, if you impair the amygdala, I would think because it works either or a p very precise area of the prefrontal cortex. So the amygdala, which mm -hmm. is this amin little thingy uh, that processes fear uh, in here, uh, if that's, that's the one that's, um, that's, that has serotonin, ha serotonin has to inhibit. Otherwise, it's processing fear too much. Okay? If you ruin that, and that's what you do with antidepressants, you don't, you ruin it just a little bit because you inhibit it. She says, and she has good reason to think, and I agree with her, that if when you take antidepressants of that kind, you are not going to feel, fall in love to the same extent. 
Well, if you want to know what the cure of that is, it's the same as because your sex drive is also affected by SSRIs. Um, well, butrin, which is an add-on, actually works on dopamine, so that's the, you can take those together and then you can bypass it. So, yes, amygdala and then a very specific part in the, you can damage those and love will be gone. Also, I think we have time for one more question. One more? That's it? Yes, I want to ask you about uh, the unrequited love where you have a loop. So, someone becomes addicted and, say, gets a certain chemical, and consequently, that, that, that addiction or that clinging produces a chemical in the other person which rejects the person who's becoming addicted and forms a loop of sorts. That's right. Is that the on-off or the pull-push? Is that, is, is that what you're asking? I don't know. I'm just saying, are there two chemicals that are being created? Like one oh, person that's off, yeah. that's um, clinging, and the other and the person that's rejecting. That, I mean, the chemical balances. Clings, the other person rejects even more. I mean, the chemical balances are just effective of that. I mean, when the other person rejects, uh, you feel kind of, uh, so you being rejected, feel a little bit of a sense of loss, a threat of being, of losing something, right? So your, your, your serotonin will now drop, whereas the other person feels more powerful, so stabilize serotonin levels. Uh, the person whose serotonin levels drop, so the person who was rejected, there's also a connection to um, actually to OCD, so you might start obsessed with dopamine being involved and actually pursue the person even more. And then it gets worse and worse and worse, uh, escalating. I think the famous case is Victor Hugo's daughter who follows his French officer all over the world. Right. That sort of thing. <laughs> that sort of thing, yeah. No serotonin, lots of dopamine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Well, I got to tell you, I, I love a Books and Books audience. You guys are great. I mean, this really, really went over well. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, you still have time to give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you. We'll ship it to you free of charge for the shipping. For those of you here, the books are for sale behind the counter. Purchase your copy. The professor will be sitting right over that table and sign them for you. Thanks so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>